Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. What a thrill to see so many people here today. It's just incredible. And you probably know that uh, today is, actually midnight last night was the introduction of the Netflix documentary on Amanda. So you'll be able to get it now if you, not right now, please, not right now, but uh, you'll be able to get it now. Uh, and it's like an hour and a half, is that right? An hour and a half? It's really phenomenal. So uh, if you don't get enough here, you can go back home and download that Netflix. So my name is Denny Cummings and I'm chairman of the authors group at the Union League Club. And I have been trying to get Amanda here for 30 or 40 years. It's been, <laughs> before she was born, I knew this was gonna be an amazing story. And, and I actually met her in New York just after she did those really two, two really tough interviews and um, talked to her about coming out to do an author event and it was not the right time to be in the public. But uh, Laura Caldwell, which, who I'm gonna tell you a lot more about, uh, runs a program at Loyola and it's called Life After Innocence. She brought her out to Chicago and that was such a great event that I thought we have to do it again at the Union League Club. So I thank you both for making this happen. So I wanna tell you more about Laura. Laura is a Loyola University law professor and she founded the first of its kind Life After Innocence program, leading teams of students to advocate for exonerees who are basically innocent people who've been wrongfully convicted, helping them reenter society and reclaiming their rights. You know, exposing this whole part of the population and letting us all know more about it is hopefully, and I'm, I know it's true, is bringing more resources, more people to the cause, and it's fantastic. Um, she's also a civil trial lawyer who's turned novelist. She's written 15, 14 thrillers and mysteries uh, they've been published in 22 countries, 13 languages. Is each book in 13 different languages? Is that how that works? <laughs> oh, okay. So they're kind of hard to read for that reason. But she did write one nonfiction book, which was actually how I met her, called Long Way Home. And I think those books are, were and are for sale. I met her because she uh, was the uh, co-legal counsel, I guess, for this young man at Cook County who hadn't really had an, a trial. He hadn't been given an, any opportunity. He'd been there like four years, am I right? F six years. And a uh, lovely guy was accused of something that he absolutely did not do. So she joined the team. After considerable work, he was found innocent. So that really started this whole program. And, and I had the pleasure of meeting Javon, and I have to tell you, he's just a great guy. I think he's already gone through law school, hasn't he? Has he finished law school? He has his bachelor's and married two kids, and he's heading for law school. So he's got his bachelor's, married, two kids, uh, is heading for law school, so his life has come back, which is magnificent. Uh, now, there's a, another book coming out in February that Laura's been very involved in called Anatomy of Innocence, The Testimonies of Wrongfully Convicted. She acted as both a contributor and an editor to this, and the contributors include Sarah Paretsky, Lee Child, Scott Turow, and a previous, previously unpublished letter from Arthur Miller. She's also just become of counsel to the law firm Caldwell Berner and Caldwell and I pronounced almost all those words correctly. So I wanna thank you again and introduce Laura Caldwell and thank her so much for being here. Thank you. And she will introduce our guest. I will. Um, thank you so much and thanks to the Union League Club for having us here. Is this too loud? Okay. Um, I was told today, and I think I want to recount, um, I was told that the Union League Club has had 1,100 authors in the last 16 years. 
It seems impossible. But I know, I know that Union League Club is this amazing place for readers and books, and I know its members are voracious, not just for reading and books, but also for being involved in the community, in our government. And every time I come here, I sense how much everyone here wants to know what's going on culturally within our various systems of government. And I think these two things, how attached the Union League Club is to and devoted is to reading and how devoted they are also to learning the true facts about what's going on and what it feels like to go through something that you sort of watch on TV. So I'm going to bring Amanda up and we're going to have a conversation, but I first just want to hopefully tell you just literally a couple sentences about her case and hopefully cut through the noise and the chaos that is all the information that's out there. It's a really simple case. We've seen this in Chicago a thousand times. If the cops or the prosecutors think you committed a crime and they're really trying hard to close this awful case, if they think it's you, you're done. And unfortunately for Amanda, they didn't catch the person who did it until after she was accused. And so we've seen it in Chicago time and again. You pick up someone, you marshal everything toward this, and you ignore what's going on that doesn't fit your theory. Here are the facts. Rudy Gaudet was caught getting on a train to Germany, and he was brought back to Italy. They had a Skype conversation where he admitted killing Meredith Kircher. Um, there was evidence all over the room. Footprints, handprints, thumbprints. This is not a whodunit, people. This is not a whodunit. We know who did it. It's Rudy Gaudet. And when they found him, because they were mortified that they'd already accused Amanda and her boyfriend, they said, come here and talk to us for a while. A few days go by, Rudy emerges with a new story. It, I was with her as well. It's ridiculous, but it's so simple. It's really not... Um, it's really not complicated. And um, just like they do here, they incentivize a witness to give testimony. Rudy Gaudet senselessly, brutally um, committed this crime. He's going to get out of jail in seven years because he gave testimony about someone else and he got a reduced sentence. So that is all troubling and tough, but what isn't troubling and tough as Amanda Knox. And someone said to me about Amanda, wow, she seems softer than I thought she would be. And I thought that was an amazing thing to say. What I've found from getting to know Amanda is that she does not hold tight to the injustices that she went through. She is using them to explore the world around her and her relationship, as she said on Good Morning America yesterday, she's exploring her relationship with freedom. So I was asked if I could describe Amanda in two words, and the first things that came to my mind were lovely and tenacious. So please help me welcome the lovely and tenacious Amanda Knox. Can you give her a water? Can you give her a water? Thank you. I'm you a water. Thanks. All right. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. So, Amanda and I did this in December, and that was, let's see, about eight months after the Italian Supreme Court, everyone, so when you talk about this event, the Italian Supreme Court has exonerated her. She is innocent, she has been acquitted, she is an exoneree. So, at that point, though, it had only been eight months. Yeah. It was very new. It was very fresh. How is it different now? I've had my, I have a little bit more time to wrap my mind around everything. I mean, as time goes by, I feel like I understand better what happened to me. And what has occurred to me now is as I continue to rebuild my relationships and, and rebuild my, my role in a world where I'm not being hunted down anymore, 
I'm you know going to grad school. I'm 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 developing my relationships. But now I'm starting to think, okay, now the better that I understand what happened to me, the better I understand what's happening to the next person. And I'm finding myself in this unique opportunity to vocalize the exonerate experience, you know, for myself, but especially for the next person who's coming through who hasn't had either the opportunity to speak or has yet, who is still fighting and is not quite humanized yet by greater society. So. You talk about you're able to see a little bit more what happened. I'm curious about when you were when you were in, as we say. Um, how much did you know about the firestorm that was kind of kicking up? Did you? I've always, frankly, it's it's sort of jarring sometimes to be friends with you now. And I re, <laughs> I remember like watching it and thinking, I wonder if she knows how crazy it is out here. Well, when I was in, I had very limited access to the outside world, obviously. Um, I knew that the case was a big thing in Italy because there wasn't a person who came into prison after me who didn't think that they knew exactly who I was. Hmm. And, you know, you can't enter a courtroom with light bulbs flashing at you like crazy without knowing that people are talking about it, at the very least in Italy. My family told me that they were also talking about it in the United States and there was a lot of controversy going on, but I didn't have direct access to it. I just knew that something was out there and I had no, I, no way of understanding what that meant for me. I was in the middle of a legal process. My day to day was how do I survive this prison environment? How do I stay in touch with the real world that I belong to and the family that misses me? That was my concern. That? How did you? And that sounds like a smart thing, keeping your sanity, keeping in touch with people who you can trust. But how did you get, like, what was your day to day? And I know the, the first trial, you didn't even understand what was being said. But what was your sort of day to day in there like? Oh, um, day in the life of prison. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I kept my head low. Um, it's, it's, Prison is a dangerous place full of people who are struggling for whatever reason. And a lot of people are mentally ill. A lot of people are struggling with addiction and, uh, you know, abuse, trauma related issues. And so I suddenly found myself like not only the foreigner because I was the American girl and everyone called me La Americana, uh, the American girl. Um, I, I found myself in in relationships with people that I had not had those kinds of relationships before. I, I was used to being in a college environment. I was used to, you know, little suburban neighborhood. And then suddenly I was, I was, my peers were, you know, people who were struggling with really big problems and who had committed really dangerous crimes. And so a lot of the time that I was there, I, kept my head low, I tried not to bring attention to myself. The sounds of the prison bothered me. Um, so I often, like the clanging of the keys and the yelling. Um, so I put in earplugs. I, I just lived with earplugs in my ears and I, I tried to just spend a long period of time during a day feeling connected to someone from my world. So I would write at least one letter a day that was pages and pages long. And I would have like my one picture that I was allowed of like with that person and one picture that I was allowed, because I was only allowed to have like 10 pictures at a time. And so I would have those 10 pictures and I would say, okay, I'm gonna focus on my mom today. And I would have my mom's picture in front of me and I would like try to channel the feeling of her being right in front of me. And, and then in the meantime, I. I tried to help out where I could. Um, I studied languages and I very quickly realized that I needed to understand Italian if I was had any hope of defending myself. So I spent a lot of time reading Italian books and I started out with Harry Potter. <laughs> in because, Italian? Nice. Yes, in Italian, and which is great. If anyone wants to learn a language, <laughs> what I recommend is read a book in the language that you want to learn that you've already read a bazillion times. Because mm. then you don't have to like figure out what's going on. You know like, Harry Potter's going for the Sorcerer's Stone. Like, 
like, you know that. So <laughs> you just read that and you read it again. And the Harry Potter series was particularly excellent because it's seven books long. So you just like stick with it. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, you, the next thing that I did was I, um, would take, like, if I was trying to learn verb conjugation, like if I'm talking about this is what I did and then I did that and I had to explain that in the courtroom, well, I had to know my verb conjugations and past conjugations in Italian are particularly tricky. So what I would do is I would say, okay, I'm going to take this, this sentence. I go to the store. I went to the store. I had gone to the store. I would have gone to the store. And I would just write it down meticulously in these notebooks and that's how I passed the time. So did you have to testify in Italian at any time? Yes, absolutely. What? Okay, so that's, it's very intense to be a witness. Um, if you had to do that in another language, I can't even imagine. But didn't you sort of learn Italian by helping out some of the other inmates? Absolutely, because the vast majority of the women who were in the prison were actually foreigners. There was, I think, 70% were foreigners. A lot of women who had been um, coming from Africa or Eastern Europe who were drug mules. And it, it was just, you know, really wow. poor people who were given this opportunity to take a package across the border and don't ask any questions, just go. And of course they would get caught up in this and then get five years in prison for mm. something like that. So you would help them translate what, their letters, their court documents? Oh yeah, I mean, the, like, even a lot of the Italian women who were in the prison were illiterate. Um, so it was a lot of watching of soap operas and um, writing letters um, that they would, they would have these people on the outside who they couldn't otherwise communicate with unless someone wrote their letters for them. And so every evening when we were allowed to move between cells, like they would open up the cells and say, okay, it's social time, now you can go to this cell and then we'll lock you back up in that cell with the other people. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we were, I would go to, from cell to cell and sit there and they would give me a juice box. Like that was, you know, the payment for writing a letter. Like they nice. just offered it to me. They were like, here you go, a juice box. Oh. And then they would dictate to me. And so I would just write it down. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you also formed a friendship with the priest there. Is that right? I know because yeah. sometimes we talk about whether you would go back to Italy and you mentioned once that someone there you would love to visit was... Yes, well, even more than just love to visit, I feel like I have to because he, I'm still in contact with Don Salo. He was the prison chaplain. He um, became my friend because he was just genuine with me and wasn't trying to get something out of me. He just was there to listen. And it was, I did not get that opportunity um, at all except for him where everyone else was just wanted to talk to me about my case and he just wanted to talk to me about me and how I was going through everything and he started out by saying Amanda I believe that you're sincere I can't tell you if I believe that you're innocent but I can tell that you're sincere and then that eventually turned into him being one of my greatest advocates and he was the one who I spent my last day in prison with playing music while I was waiting to hear my fate you know wow so, and when you say playing music what do you mean Oh, um, he, one of the things that he managed to finagle was um, I played music for the um, church every Sunday. And so, or it was held on Saturdays because he was holding his church on Sundays. And so that I could play the guitar again, um, he came up with this plan where I had to come and practice um, like a couple of times a nice. week in this room with a guitar for church. And that meant that I got to practice playing the Beatles. <laughs> so nice. that was great. <laughs> yeah. What a great escape. Yeah. So you mentioned waiting for your fate. Um, and as we know, your case kind of went, um, you know, back and forth and, um, in terms of what happened. But when, on your release, so you're talking about the day you were, I mean, were you released that day? Yes, so this was, um, I had already been convicted, and then two years later, I was still ongoing with the appeal, and it was the last day of the appeal. And the way that they do it is they just put you through this. Um, so you have to go into court, and they say, okay, it's officially the last day of court. Now the jury goes in and deliberates. And then you just sit around for a while. And what they did in this case was they figured that it would take a long time. Usually you just sit in a cell in, wow. in the courthouse. And um, so they took me back to the prison in this case, and I, I mean, I knew that this was maybe one of my last hopes because, 
you know, going into my first conviction, I never thought that I would, I could be convicted. It never occurred to me because like as bad as things are going, if I'm innocent, I'm not going to be found guilty. It, it, and, you know, I had already spent two years in prison for a crime I didn't commit, and it still didn't strike me that I could be actually convicted. Mm -hmm. And then to have that, like, the, the way that I understood the criminal justice system be completely turned over on itself by that conviction, like, by the time that I was going into my appeal, no matter how good it was going, I was still terrified. I didn't know what I could trust anymore. And so I, I was... I was just scared and I knew that there was this thing that was bigger than me that was taking over my life and I just had to hang on. Did you, um, you know, I think a lot of people are sitting here thinking, wow, she could be me, she could be my daughter. Um, and that's absolutely true. Your daughter goes off for a, you know, foreign study and the love of languages and having the best time of her life. And I've met your mom. Um, absolutely adore her and I know your stepdad was amazing and your dad was amazing how did they sort of you know now in in viewing it from that distance how did they sort of get through it do we know well what I, what I love about just to return to something that you said prior to even that um, is I, I love what you said about how it can happen to anyone and it's really important like that's one of the major things that I, I hope to convey that one of the major reasons I'm even talking about it as opposed to just kind of sitting alone thinking about it is that um, it can happen to anyone. It's not this distant anomaly that happens to kind of weird people. It's, it's something that can happen to anyone. Anyone can have an accusation thrown at them and then to be recharacterized by that accusation and be made to respond to it without it having anything to do with you. And it's I think that we struggle, like I struggled. I struggled for two years while I was imprisoned to realize that all of the safeguards of the system may not be enough. And that when the criminal justice system is grounded in people and the flaws, you know, human beings are amazing and they're strong and they have, they have incredible power to turn something negative into good, they also have prejudices and they also have agendas and, and, and that can thwart the criminal justice system in an incredible way that I don't think we all really like to think about. Well, you know, so Life After Innocence is at Loyola Law School and, and we started because we recognized all this great work was being done to get people out of prison and everyone who's getting people out of prison was trying to help them start over, but there was such a vast need. So we've worked with probably 50 exonerees at, at Life After Innocence at Loyola and when I met you, I was just so struck by how different I thought your story was hmm. and how it was exactly the same. Your innocence always plays against you. You always think, like, can you come talk to me about this incident? Sure. Yeah. You didn't, if you didn't do Wrongful it, of course. Well, how can I help? False confessions are especially that case. And false confessions. Yeah, I mean, uh, have you read Professor Saul Kasson's work? No. Oh my gosh, if you have not read, okay, Professor Saul Kasson, everyone, like, Saul he's Kassin. the guy. So he's this professor in New York who is an expert researcher on interrogation techniques and how, you know, sure, they're very impressive for getting the guilty person to confess. The ugly side of it is they're also very effective at getting innocent people to confess. And they're, he's done incredible research in the, like, the coercive way that they kind of break a person down over time to to make them think that they don't even know what they're talking about and to like to you know bank on the fact that the person is just trying to help you know the person mm -hmm. is there to respond and to respect the the criminal justice that needs to be done and to respect those authority figures and to put you in a situation where you are not quite sure who you're talking about because they're sending in and out investigators to question you. They question you over and over again. They try to like break down what you've said and then offer you alternative, you know, alternative ideas that could make sense of their deconstruction of your experience. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's incredibly effective at putting innocent people at risk of wrongful conviction. But then, you know, and that's true in English. If you're 
if you have someone and you're both speaking the same language, yeah. but you're also in a country you, you were unfamiliar with a few months before and you're speaking an entirely different language. Oh, yeah. I mean, it must just, I always describe um, being innocent and in jail as, from what I've learned from speaking with exonerees, as being one of the most surreal experiences that you keep thinking you'll wake up from and it keeps happening. Um, and then layer onto it your sort of... Um, the, the, the craziness, the intenseness, and being in another country. Um, someone had said to me, what, is she, was she always an old soul? And was it this kind of craziness that you are an old soul, but do you think that was always there? I think... Gosh, am I even an old soul? I don't know. Do you think you are? Uh, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> like, um, Maybe not. I I think that I think a lot about things. Um, and that, especially since I was put through this experience where some of the only good thing that I can do for extended periods of time was to think. Um, but I've always been someone who cared deeply about people and experiences and the way that we communicate them. I mean, that's why I was studying languages. That's why I had such a close bond with all of my family and friends. It's just what what I was missing was, well, I was 20 years old. I was a kid, so it's not like I knew much about life. And then suddenly I was put in a position where who I was was tested at the most limit. Extreme. Yes, it was, it was an extreme situation where I had to hang on to what I knew was right and, and somehow make sense of the fact that everything was going wrong. And I spent a lot of time just thinking about that, so I don't know if that's what comes across. Well, and you mentioned writing, and I did want to ask you about that. Um, when people ask me, what, what's she doing now? It's like, well, she's a writer, and she's always been a writer. You got a degree in creative writing. Mm -hmm. um, you write a column, which I love, um, Google Amanda's View, Thanks. West Seattle <laughs> Herald. You're very, f and you're also going to, you're planning on getting a master's in fine arts in creative writing. Mm -hmm. I was curious, though, about your column. You are very frank in your column. You Last week, I loved your column about open caskets and just where did that come from? Why do we need that? You've written about your partner, Chris, and this birthday celebration he had for you. <laughs> it's personal, and I yeah. wonder why you decided to do that when... And people, I, I keep looking, and I'm like, oh, my God, she's got the comments open. Mm -hmm. Like, it makes me nervous, but you are... Why did you want to put your own views and per person out there when you've had such a kind of crazy media experience? Well, I think it's in response to that crazy media experience that I, I for one, do not think that the media is evil. If anything, I think it's beautiful. It's this, this just like literature, it's our way of presenting information to each other and conveying it through personal experience. Like, if anything, I've, I've started out a creative writing fiction writer and I've moved towards memoir because I realized that I have so many thoughts about everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, like, I, and I try to imagine what they mean in a greater context. And I'm, I'm responding to the fact that there was so much put out there that came from nothing. And I instead want to put forth what's come from actual experience and, and, and respond to that. Say, you know, there's a real human being behind every writer. And there's a real human being behind every headline. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you shouldn't forget. Right. Now, um, we mentioned that the documentary um, about you was released last night at midnight. Somebody got up at four in the morning and watched it. That was impressive. Awesome. <laughs> now, we should say, though, this is not... I was mistakenly saying, oh, Amanda's documentary is coming out. No, it's, um, it's not my documentary. Um, I... So I, I could not make a documentary about my case. I couldn't presume to make a documentary about my case. I'm the subject. Like, I can't, I can't do that. Um, instead, what I've had to wonder about is whether or not it's worthwhile 
to participate in someone else's recreation and vision of what happened in my case. And in a lot of cases, I've thought that that wasn't worthwhile because I didn't trust I didn't trust the conveyor. I, I mm -hmm. thought that they had an agenda. I thought that they they came into it with a already an understanding about what they thought they knew and what they didn't. And I thought that they were limiting it to a, a who done it. Did she do it or didn't she do it? And I think that in in my case, I mean, every case has its own greater implications. And I and what what drew me to the filmmakers who created this particular documentary was the fact that they approached me and said, hey, if you ever want to just tell us what you want us to know about this case, we're here to listen. And we're doing that with everyone. And I loved it how they didn't make it seem like, you know, you got railroaded and we're gonna you know turn this around like, like I did <laughs> right right well and you know I, I, I appreciate that too yeah, yeah, because yeah. I, I needed that at a certain time but when it comes to like reflecting about the bigger picture like when it comes to thinking okay this is not just about Amanda and this is not just about this one injustice why does it matter and it matters because it has ripple effects throughout our justice system. Every time we have one court do it wrong, it's another excuse for the next court to do it wrong. And I think what's really fascinating about their portrayal of my case is that, one, they recognized that when the prosecutor has tunnel vision and has certain biases that take them away from examining a case, it makes it it's no longer about the person who died. It's no longer about right. the person who lost everything. It's about proving that they were right. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I really love about this documentary is the, the fact that they show that it's really people who are implementing the justice system and that the justice system has its strengths, has its weaknesses. It's always an evolution. We're always learning from our mistakes. But in the end, it's people who are responsible for it. And we have to look at the people from a three-dimensional standpoint to actually get any truth out of it. I think Vanity Fair said that it, it shed more light than all, like, you know, 10 years of reporting because it didn't demonize. Right. It just let people and the people who were influential me, my co-defendant, the prosecutor, uh, members of the media, experts, to present their perspective, not just about this case, but about how this happened and what's important and what's motivating us and what's compelling us. And all of those different perspectives as seen through different kinds of people with different kinds of backgrounds yeah. really shed such light on what happened. I mean, I'm relieved to get to know the prosecutor better so that I could right. understand where he was coming from. Because it's moving to me that like he was so driven to try to get justice for Meredith's family. Or Meredith and her you family. Know, like he was there when the mom had to go and identify her body. And like of course you're gonna be like made You're furious about that and you want right. something you want to do it and you want to get the person and then of course what he didn't realize is when he looked at me and just didn't like the look of me that that didn't mean that he was right and he just translated that like passion to do right for her into this phantom justice that he was going to deliver to the family that wasn't actual justice and i think we see that a lot where you know, I do get riled up about your case, and that's why I wanted to just talk about it really quick and kind of cut through the crap. But um, I think, you know, we see that a lot. This is the criminal justice system is a human system, it's not a factory. It's not a factory, it's human, it's made up of humans. So, to your point, I think. Um, Number one, learning about who's involved in the criminal justice system and who operates it because it isn't a factory mm -hmm. is really important. And also, the other thing that I think is important, which I know you want to do so much, is to humanize the person who went through it and what that meant for their family, for the kids they left behind. Um, and I can tell you that, you know, 
you have become the darling of the exoneree world. <laughs> Exonerees are a tough crowd. They're used to sussing out people in prison really quick. It took me like years to get certain people to even talk to me. Amanda comes in and it's like, oh, baby girl. <laughs> And everyone, and so how has it been getting to know all these other people? Because I know you felt so alone in so many ways, and now here you're a part of a community. Oh, can I say that it's just like such a relief? Okay, so there was no Innocence Project in Italy. Like, that didn't exist. Um, in fact, they only just started an Innocence Project in Italy because of my case. Um, and I came back into a world where I felt like I was the only one and I didn't really know how I was supposed to relate to anyone after that. And it was really difficult. I, I, I hid. I just spent a lot of time with like just in my little family unit, not getting to know people, not, not engaging with the rest of my world outside of my tiny family that I knew I was safe in because I didn't know that you could relate to someone about this kind of thing. And then it was, um, it was Greg Hempikin, who's the director of the Idaho Innocence Project, who reached out to me and said, look, girl, it's been a few years, <laughs> get to the Innocence Network conference. And I was like, a conference? Like, I can't do that. Um, but, you know, he eventually convinced me that it was going to be good for me because there were going to be people like me there. And I walked into a situation where it was better than anything that I ever could have expected. It was people who took one look at me and said, we don't, you are safe. Like no one's going to hurt you here. We get it. Like we're your people and you don't, no one's trying to get something out of you. Like, look here, come here. Well, you know, don't let make anyone talk to you. If you don't want to like, here you go. We're right here. It's cool. Like we, we got you your back. Yeah. And I immediately felt like I had, like, I've never had that experience before where I felt like I had a family immediately. Mm. And, and I feel that to this day where like, I'm, I'm baffled that everyone isn't just in utterly moved by how smart and gentle and strong these people are and how important their stories are for all of us, what the implications of their story for all of us are, and also what they have to offer. I mean, absolutely. So that's what really compels me at this point is like, I'm falling apart with this thing. I'm not used to microphones. Well, it, 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 <laughs> no, I know what you mean, though. And I, that's what, you know, at Life After Innocence, we're trying to say, hey, not only should we recognize that this happens, but let's look at the people it happens to. Yeah. And it's so great to hear you say that, because that's always been my impression, too, that it's just this kind of warm place. And I know everybody's thrilled that you're a part of it. And I'm getting signaled that we have some audience questions. Oh, okay. okay. So, as I was sitting here, I was coming up in my own mind with a thousand questions, and I know each of you have an equal amount, and we don't have any massive amount of time, unfortunately, but uh, so what we've done is we've identified four people in the audience that uh, can ask questions, and we will have them ask their question, which limits everybody else except that Amanda's going to be signing more books over across the hall here, and you can talk to her at that point in time. Uh, Amanda, uh, amazing. Amazing oh, to have you. you here. Thank you. <laughs> so I don't have to wait another 30 years, right, to, <laughs> to get your... So let me uh, start by calling Lori, Lori Berry. Can you just speak up loudly? Sure, I can. Thank you so much, Amanda. Oh, thank you. Oh yeah, I, I would not be the person I am today if it weren't for the fact that I had my family and my friends and then the people who who came out, who, who learned about my story and who came out to support me. I had, you know, I, I had my Italian professor at the University of Washington coming to Italy to visit hmm. me so that he could craft a curriculum for me, 
like to, you know, study poetry while I was in prison, where, you know, the prison guards would be like, what are you studying poetry for? You're never getting out. And I would just, you know, like wow. stuff like that. And like, but like really establishing that my world was not the prison world. That even though I was the ideal prisoner, which is how the guards called me, like, I was like, that's because I don't belong here. Like, you know. Um, no big fights in the halls. You no know, big fights in the halls, mostly just keeping my head down. Um, but, like, I would not be the person I am today if it weren't for that. And, I, like, the, the place that I find myself now is where I want to pay that forward. I want to, like, give what I've received whether it be negative or positive, like I've received so much negative media attention that I want to turn that into like positive media attention for other people. And I want like awareness that I have to be shared, not so much for my sake because I'm, I'm done, you know, I'm, I'm free, but for the next person who's still fighting. So that's, that's where I'm coming from is trying to like take that support and pay it forward. So Laura, uh, do we have an exonery here? We do, if I can introduce Mr. Mario Cachorro. Mario, um, this is kind of personal because this is a, my dad and I's hometown uh, where he was wrongfully convicted of a murder 200th time where there was no body. Um, and again, like Amanda's case, we know who did it. Mario, however, just like Amanda is saying, okay, well, what do I do now? I went away to prison for something I didn't do. He is in law school at Loyola, and he owns a grocery store in Woodstock. He is a full-on business man at the same time he's going to law school, so he's oh, right. amazing. Oh, right. So can I get really cheap food? <laughs> Discounts on <laughs> apples? Um, so let me call on... Um, actually, the person that woke up at the crack of dawn to watch the documentary, Gene Brown. All right. Thank you for joining us. Today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, how are your relationships today with the people uh, you knew from before you were wrongfully accused? Did everybody hear the question? So uh, the people you knew before you were wrongfully accused, like high school friends high or school friends, different people, or... and you go into this huge experience... I mean, so the nice thing about them is they know me, you know, they didn't, they knew that what was being put out there about me was insane. It wasn't just like, un, it wasn't, it wasn't just bad, it was unreal. And they've, they've all been so kind and just there. I mean, I had friends from college showing up at five o'clock in the morning at my mom's house for my 10 minute phone call once a week mm -hmm. so they could just hear my voice. They couldn't even, you know, talk to me. I had 10 minutes to talk to my entire family and everyone would, they just put on speakerphone and my friends would either stay the night or get up at three o'clock in the morning to take the bus to my mom's house just so that they could be there to say, hi, like oh. all together. That's it, you know, and once a week for 10 minutes, like hmm. all those people have, remained a part of my life and you know they've all gone on to have lives of their own and they've all had these experiences and milestones in their life that I didn't really get to participate in but that right. they you know wrote to me about and wanted me to just at least be aware of and um, I'm still trying to you know make up for lost time mm -hmm. and the kinds of things that talk about the kinds of things that they didn't want to tell me because they didn't want to burden me with because right. I'm, you know, I'm the one who's in prison so I can't tell her that my boyfriend broke up with mm -hmm. me, you know, like, mm -hmm. right. you know? Yeah. and I'm like, no, tell me. Please, please, please. Like, yeah, and so at this point I'm trying to like let them know that it's okay, like we can all be vulnerable yes. together mm -hmm. and it's not me, you know, so. Amazing. You know, I see somebody in the audience here that I want to acknowledge uh, about 16 years ago I had this incredibly bizarre idea that it would be cool to bring fascinating people to the club to talk. But I had no idea how to do that because I had no budget. I couldn't pay them to come. And I thought, man, this is going to be really hard. And then I thought, well, how about if I could become, or the club could become a destination for a, a book sale, for the inter introduction of a new book. And uh, so I came to the general manager at the time and said, I've got this really crazy idea. This is John McCabe right over here at this table. And he said, yes, it's a stupid idea. 
But then he did everything possible to support me and has uh, designated an author suite, which is where you guys are. Which is sweet. Um, I mean, he's, <laughs> which is sweet. Sweet, sweet. <laughs> I hope, I hope he, she likes it. So uh, I just want to acknowledge it. John, you did me so many favors. Thank you. Hi, John. And John um, was amazing when we, we came in, Jovan and I came in to talk about Long Way Home. And in fact, the man who was killed in this case was a valet um, person here at the club, wow. Howard Thomas. So I remember coming in and, and John saying, well, you and I got to sit down and talk about this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we did, and it was great, so thank you. Yeah, and 1,100 authors later, you know, yeah. he still thinks it's a stupid <laughs> idea. <laughs> So, <laughs> oh, nice. The nice book collection. So, I want to call on uh, Stacy Fleming. Stacy, where are you? Okay, be real loud. Hi, Stacy. That's a great question um, because I think that. So, on. To be clear, I have. I'm. I'm. I'm great. Like I. I have my family, I have my friends. Ever since I came home, I came home to full support. So even as I was going through being convicted again and then having to like wonder if I was going to have to deal with an extradition battle, like I had, you know, I had everyone who was close to me there. I had supporters who were there for me. Um, and I was fortunate for that. And a lot of exonerees don't have that. A lot of exonerees come home to, you know, barely any support and no guarantees, and that is something that should be addressed. Um, but I think the one thing that people don't know, at least because media presents exonerees as these kind of like two-dimensional fallouts from like brutal tragedies, and they kind of have this little news flash about justice prevailing, and they're eating a hamburger, and that's the end of it, you know? Exoneration, done and done. And it's not, it's not, it's like the beginning of a whole new story where you're struggling to find yourself and your life again in this world that turned its back on you. And, mm. and I think that the best, you know, one of the things that exonerees really struggle with and that I struggle with as well is like just, you know, being acknowledged for what we are, for having gone through something and for needing help and just being recognized as someone who is a victim of the criminal justice system and not being afraid to say that and not being ashamed to say that and not being, you know, told, well, it's your fault, you know, somehow it's your fault. And I think that it's all, I think all the cases that we've seen, it's all too easy for something to be turned on you that you didn't build, you didn't create this monster. Crazy. And, um, and I think all exonerees are struggling through that. and. It's something that I, I hope to bring more attention to, even as I'm a lucky person. I'm, I'm, I'm going, you know, I'm applying to grad school. Not, you know, not yeah. many people can do that when they don't have a place to live when they first come home, you know? So, exactly. Yeah. So uh, the last question is from John Bertram. Would you stand, John? Hi, John. Oh. Can you stand, John? Yes, he <laughs> can. He's quite able. <laughs> Oh, thanks. <laughs> yes, um, and this is really important to me because it's not all exonerees get the chance to, you know, I mean, it sounds weird to say get a chance to have like the media scrutinize you intensely for a prolonged <laughs> period of time. Like it's, it's a terrible, insane thing that I had to somehow learn to manage um, and that I continue to have to figure out mm. how to interact with because it's this beast that has a life of its own and I have to engage with it in an, in an intelligent way, but mm. I also have to continually reaffirm my own humanity in the face of it. And I think that that's the thing that struck me is that if I'm still having to continue to like point out that I'm a human being, like for the exonerees who yeah. are completely forgotten about, like that, 
drives me crazy. Like, I can't stand the idea that, like, there are these people who aren't really being acknowledged for what they went through, that they're people, that, they, that it hurt, and that they're, that they're never going to get the life that they had back, and that it doesn't feel like the world cares. And that they have a, not only is their story important, but like it, it should matter a little bit more to us than, than it seems the greater society or the greater media landscape is willing to allow it. Right. And I want, I, I want to provoke, <laughs> really, I want to provoke a more thoughtful and compassionate discussion that allows other exonerees to be raised up and have their voices heard. Yeah, I so. know. You're always trying to turn it around, and you're so good about that. And I, 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 to get in a plug, because I think this directly relates to what you're saying, the book that is coming out in um, February is called Anatomy of Innocence. You can pre-order it now. Proceeds go to Life After Innocence to help people, exonerees who are starting over. But that's exactly what we got Scott Chirot and Sarah Paretsky and Lee Child and an unpublished Arthur Miller piece is little snapshots of what it's like. What it's like to get the knock on the door that says, can you come talk to us? What is it like to sit in trial and have someone point at you and say, that lady with the blonde hair, mm -hmm. she's the one who hurt me. It's in this case, she actually... And she, but, you know, that's another story for another day. <laughs> and what it's like to f try to find help when you're in, what it's like to deal with. And so we, and instead of re-traumatizing, as we're doing here to you, um, we, we're just taking little snapshots. And I hope that that will, and, you know, enable us to continue this discussion of what it's like for you and what it's like when we get it wrong. And to empower, like the thing is like, exonerees should feel empowered to take ownership yeah. of what happened to them yeah. and to not feel like they, that has to be this weird part of their life that should be shunted to the shadows. Like you are a valuable human being for what you went through. Right. And it's my fault if I haven't conveyed that to you, you know? And so like, that's what I keep trying to convey to my, you know, my exonerees. They're, I know, they're, your peeps. They're my peeps. <laughs> they're my tribe. It's like, I value you, and that, that's not to be taken for granted, just like life and freedom. Well, I unfortunately have to wrap this up, which is really hard. It's like stopping a symphony right in the middle of it. <laughs> We've uh, there, there are just two final comments I'd make. One is, you know, we brought in all kinds of interesting people, from sports stars to actors, actresses, military leaders, business leaders, uh, top politicians, to talk about their stories. And then we've mixed in some people who just talk to your heart that I think may have a chance of changing your life. And I think certainly today is a major example of that. Aww. And I really want to thank you for that. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So the way it's changed my life, I mean, is I don't have to stalk you anymore. We're, <laughs> we're actually having like you. everyone else. Uh, and the other thing I want to mention is that we have, um, you know, a lot of pictures were taken uh, by our professional photographer throughout this morning, and you can look on the Union League Club Facebook page to right to find those pictures, and they'll be on probably midweek next week. So uh, again, I want to tell you that Amanda's going to be signing some more books over there. We don't have a huge supply of them, but uh, we, we do have um, book plates so that if uh, we don't have a book, she'll sign a book plate for you and you can get a book uh, at another bookstore. So I want to thank you all very much for coming. Another interesting comment is that um, this is the noon hour in downtown Chicago, as you know. Many people are leaving their jobs to come here. And um, what did it? nine out of ten times, there's kind of this little stream of people uh -huh. that start to leave uh, early because they want to get the elevator and they want to get back to the job. I think I've kind of three people that have left, which is really uh -huh. a commentary on the power of your story. Oh, thank you. And the power I of you. That. Thank you. So we're going to have to have you come back a lot. Yay. Just to keep people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and Laura. My God, thank you so much. Thank you. We look forward to your book coming out in February. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, this is great. Yeah. Thank oh. you. Perfect.
Oh, group hug. Thank you. Oh, we love group hugs.